When Amy looks herself up at the library, she discovers that a website has been set up in an effort to find her. The URL is findamazingamy.com, and if you visit that site, it takes you to the studio's website. But if you look at an archived version of that page from 2014 when the movie came out, you get something a little bit more interesting. And it seems that it's not too different from the main screen on the Blu-ray. However, there are many other web pages, TV screens, and billboards we can scrape for information, as well as other things you might have missed. So stick around to the end of this video. This video is sponsored by Hunt a Killer. But it's easy. Gone Girl is not a horror movie. You're not allowed to cover it. Okay, if Gone Girl isn't a horror movie, explain why I can't show any of this scene. So, uh, with that settled, let's start looking for clues. Well, we have our first clue. When Nick enters the bar on the morning of Amy's disappearance, he's holding the game Mastermind. In the novel, Nick and Margot had this thing where they'd bring over old board games and toys from their childhood home to help pass time at the bar. Although we don't know it yet, perhaps Mastermind is symbolic of his wife masterminding a plan to get back at him for his infidelity. There are also other games and books in the stack that seem to represent things that would eventually happen in the story. There's Emergency, Widowmaker, Missouri has the death penalty, Sex Escort, I don't know, I'd have to check my red panty inventory. Jailbait. How old is she? She's in her early 20s. Let's make a deal. This is why I have a $100,000 retainer. I win the unwinnable cases. $100,000. We'll figure something out. The hot seats. Nick Gunn. You're probably the most hated man in America right now. I probably am. There's also a miniature Tom Sawyer riverboat to go along with the journal page about when Amy first met Nick and he told her he's from the childhood home of Mark Twain, the author that created Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. Tom Sawyer famously attended his own funeral after his family thought him to be dead, which is nearly what happens with Amy, watching her family search for her after her disappearance and presumed death. When Nick doesn't feel like talking, his sister offers to distract him with more excruciatingly mundane stories. It is never mentioned in the movie, but in the book, Telling these stories is a game that Nick and Go play, inspired by their mom, who had a habit of telling such outrageously mundane, endless stories. There are other instances of sort of inside jokes for those who have read the book, like in the scene where Nick first meets Amy and asks, who are you? And she gives him a variety of multiple choice answers. A, I'm an award-winning scrimshander. B, I'm a moderately influential warlord. C, I write personality quizzes for magazines. When we're reading through Amy's diary entries in the book, this is something that she does all the time with her audience, as a what do you think I did, or one of the following is actually what happened. By the way, when we see Amy writing the journal entries, you may notice all of the different pens she used, evidence that she's faking the entire journal, by using different pens to make it look like the entries were written on different days. Then there's the Ellen Abbott segment, where the prominent talk show host is analyzing Nick's life and makes the suggestion that he and his sister are disturbingly close. I didn't use the I word. I said you two were extremely close. Ellen never makes this insinuation in the book, but rather, it was a rumor that went around when Nick and Go were in high school, a part of Nick's life that is never covered in the movie. There are a ton of nods to the book in this scene, where the police discover Amy's diary. Detective Boney flips through the pages, and if you pause, you can see little snippets of Amy's writing. It seems as if the entirety of Amy's journal entries in the novel have been copied down into this journal by hand and more. It reminds me of the last episode of Things You Missed, where I covered another movie directed by David Fincher, Zodiac, where I mentioned that every newspaper on set was that day's paper printed in full. So I have no doubt that Amy's entire diary is here. By the way, there is a connection to Zodiac here. At the end of my Zodiac episode, I mentioned that I'd be closing the Zodiac case and moving on to the Amy Dunn case. And Zodiac ended with this survivor, Mike Majo, identifying this suspect as the Zodiac. Well, as the missing person investigation gets underway in Gone Girl, the same actor who played the young version of Mike Majo also plays the police officer who finds the first clue. There are other David Fincher movie callbacks too. When Go is watching Noelle Hawthorne's interview on Ellen Abbott, she's drinking a glass of wine. The brand is Norton. Edward Norton plays the main character from Fincher's Fight Club. Side note, strange choice of beverage to accompany your cereal and milk. In the book, Amy takes Desi out with a kitchen knife. So why in the movie has it been changed to a box cutter? The only reason that I can think of is to reference the most iconic scene of David Fincher's Sasevena. And finally, while Detective Boney is reading the Amy diary, her partner asks, In that diary again? 
You know how it ends. To which she replies, It interests me. The same exact line used by a character named Lizbeth when she goes through some documents related to a murder case in Fincher's previous movie, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Why would a young lady like you want to know about such an awful murder? It interests me. Knowing Fincher, everything he does is very deliberate, and we can look into the background details of many other Gone Girl scenes for even more things you missed. The season we've been waiting for all year has finally arrived, and there's been a lot of disappointment in the horror community because haunted houses, Halloween parties, and horror movie premieres have all fallen victim to COVID-19. Many of us are left wondering how we'll celebrate our favorite holiday this year, and one of the coolest things that I've found is Hunt a Killer's new Blair Witch game. It's basically a subscription box that puts you in the center of a new horror mystery taking place in the universe of one of the greatest found footage movies of all time, The Blair Witch Project. Each season consists of six episodes. When you open the box, you'll receive your case file, which consists of realistic evidence. We're talking journals, police reports, maps, and other documents that'll help you solve the mystery of Black Hills Forest. If I could compare to anything, I'd say it really has the feeling of an escape room. It's very hands-on, and it makes you a character in the story. There are certain parts where you'll make a revelation, and it's genuinely just creepy and unsettling. Right now, just for Things You Miss viewers, you can go to hunterkiller.com slash CZsWorld and use code CZsWorld for 20% off your first box. Again, make sure to use code CZsWorld for a 20% discount and to show your support for the show. Can you survive the curse of the Blair which Fincher is a master of storytelling in the subtext, and throughout the movie, there are many brilliant examples that you may not have thought about while watching. When Nick and Go are playing the game of life in the bar, he adds a wife to his car, but never adds a child. This plays into the whole dispute about Amy supposedly wanting a child, and then not wanting one, and then wanting one again. In their living room, there's a box from a brand called Piranesi. As far as I can tell, this isn't a real brand, it's likely a reference to the Italian artist Piranesi, who is known for his etchings of fictitious and atmospheric prisons. The box is found right next to the staged crime scene designed by Amy to get Nick thrown in prison, or worse. As Nick takes the two detectives through the crime scene, he quickly moves on from the kitchen to show them the next room, but Boney notices the blood splatter on the backsplash. This makes Nick look very suspicious. Amy's a writer, but her degree is in psychology, again, setting up her mastermind of a plan. In the flashback at the release event for the new Amazing Amy book, this guy is way too delighted to rub it in Amy's face that she's not married. Because it's my understanding you are not married. Not counting that as a thing you missed, but I just find it funny. The flashback of Nick and Amy's kiss cuts directly to Nick getting his cheek swabbed because he's suspected of Amy's murder. Brilliant cut. In another flashback, when Amy and Nick are doing the second anniversary treasure hunt at the library, we see a book facing the camera. Now I'm not sure if it says twin or twain, but either way it's still relevant. Nick is part of a set of twins living in the land of Mark Twain. I'm, I'm counting it. I'm not sure how there's a secret area of this library that only they knew about, but... Moving on, Macaulay Culkin has a cameo for some reason. It's the kid from Home Alone. There's a theory that he's a young John Kramer. <laughs> no, I don't I don't actually know if that's him, but it's pretty funny. All right, moving on to a real one. The police show Nick pictures of Amy with Noelle Hawthorne because Nick previously claimed that she wasn't friends with Amy. Amy only befriended her as part of her plan, and in one of these photos, they're seen together at Andy's Frozen Custard. I recognize it because we used to go there after baseball games sometimes. I think this fits in with the idea that Amy is taking Nick on a tour of shame with her treasure hunt. All of the clues were at places that Nick was together with his mistress, Andy. So this is another secret way of her telling Nick. This is because of Andy. There's also something poetic about the fact that Amazing Amy from the children's books ends up with a guy named Abel Andy, and the real Amy ends up with a guy who cheats on her with a girl named Andy. At one point, the police ask what Amy does with her time, and he tells him that she's always got a book in her hand. We later find that to be kind of true. Little does Nick know, she's actually researching her revenge on him. Later on, she's checking in to see how everything panned out, and she decides to look up Ellen Abbott on Google to see if she's covered Nick on her show yet. After she types the letters E-L, one of the autocomplete suggestions is eliminate your spouse in three easy steps. And at that moment, she felt very stupid. She could have done it in three steps, but instead, she overcomplicated the process to hundreds of steps. But meanwhile, Nick is headed to the airport to go meet with Tanner Bolt. And there's a billboard for Sharon Cheever, the other big talk show host in this universe. And as Nick walks by it, Sharon turns almost as if to look at him. It's like she's eyeing him as a potential big story to have on her show, and he would eventually go on that show under Bolt's recommendation. You know, I could probably forgive Nick for killing his wife, and I could maybe even forgive him for cheating on her, but this, this is just unforgivable, Nick. You've just lost my sympathy. But right before this big 
big Sharon Schieber interview, there's a great moment that shows how far Nick has come as a character. Early on, he was criticized for cracking a nervous smile at the press conference for his missing wife, but by this point in the story, he's become much more careful. Sharon gives him this huge smile at the start of the interview, and his instinct is to smile back, but he fights it and remains stoic. It's a minor detail, but it's very powerful. Oftentimes, in Things You Missed episodes, we'll find that taking a closer look whenever we're looking at text will yield some good old crew reference Easter eggs. Now, there are a good amount of them here, so I'm going to go through them all very quickly. The Amazing Amy book illustrations are by Kirk Van Warmer. He's part of Gone Girl's art department. If you pause on the directory of the building where Tanner Bolt's law office is, you'll see Bolinowski Labs, a reference to special effects coordinator Ron Bolinowski, Bradford Ralston Insurance Brokers, named after the sound utility man Bradford Ralston, Bozeman and Associates, named after Gary Bozeman of the Transportation Department, Curtis Childers, and something. You can't make out the rest of it. But Curtis Childers is credited as a construction foreman. Dingle and George Brothers references three people. Robert Dingle, Tyree Dingle, and Brett George. They all worked in the transportation department. There may be others like Brown or Campbell, but those are pretty common names. I'm going to move on to some more references that I'm sure about. Like the credits of the Ellen Abbott show, where you'll see that Ellen Abbott's editor is named William Peake. In the Gone Girl credits, there's a Billy Peake who is an assistant editor. Ellen's art directors are Tyler Nelson and Eric Wiedit, an assistant editor and a visual effects artist on Gone Girl, respectively. And lastly, Ellen Abbott's makeup department has a Chad Peter and Lila Bull. Chad is Gone Girl's visual effects compositor, and Lila Bull, I believe, is the wife of Gone Girl's post-production coordinator, Randall James Bull. The two work together on the second Lego movie, which is Lila's only credits so far. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned that the URL, findamazingamy.com, actually worked at one time. So I was curious about the phone numbers as well. So I decided I'm gonna call them. Here are a few more things I love about Hunt a Killer's Blair Witch Box. The story. As soon as I started looking over the evidence, I immediately got hooked on it. You start to learn who the major characters are, gain an understanding of the town, and you really become invested in solving the case. This one follows a woman named Rosemary Kent, who lives on the edge of the infamous Black Hills Forest, and she needs our help to find her missing son, Liam. The lore is really good too. This isn't just a generic game of Clue with a Blair Witch logo slapped on it. They actually partnered with Lionsgate to make something that works within the Blair Witch universe. Everything they send you feels like it belongs longs in a Blair Witch movie, so everything feels very immersive. If you love things you missed, you'll love looking out for those little clues, and it's a great feeling whenever you unlock a new discovery. It's the perfect way to get creeped out, whether you're stuck at home alone or if you want to team up with a partner. And unlike most ARGs, you're not just staring at a screen the whole time. You're going to be getting a 20% discount using my link, which you can find in the description. That's huntakiller.com slash world and use code CZsWorld for 20% off. Unfortunately, when you try to call the phone numbers seen on the screen in Gone Girl, you won't have much more luck than you would trying to get to the Find Amazing Amy website. But upon looking it up, I found that calling the Amy tip line used to result in a recorded message of someone reading a passage of the novel in a creepy monotone voice. If anyone has this recording, please upload it. I'm interested in hearing what it was. But on that note, I have a passage of my own to read, and it leads into the next thing you missed. I am so lucky this is my husband. This man will be the father of my children. We'll all be so happy, but I may be wrong. I may be very wrong. This is one of several instances in Amy's diary where she considers herself lucky to be with Nick. And the movie seems to touch on the theme of luck quite a few times. First, there's the old saying, luck of the Irish. Let's roll that clip. Well, the Irish prince graces us with his presence. His majesty prefers not to be moistened. But that's not all. Amy's middle name, as seen on her degree, is Wexford. Wexford is the name of a town in Ireland. This part of her name isn't in the book. When Amy meets up with Desi Collings, it's at a casino. Winning money at a casino is luck of the draw, and at that casino, somebody recognizes her and asks if she's one of the Nolan sisters. The Nolan sisters are an Irish pop group known for their hit, I'm in the mood for dancing. Now in the book, this man asks if she's part of the Enlow family, so there must be some reason for this change, right? Like I said, when Fincher does something, you can bet there's a reason for it. The existence of the casino is also teased really early on, when we first see the Find Amy billboard. And the name, the Riverboat Casino, ties back into the Tom Sawyer thing that I mentioned earlier. And remember when I brought up Margot's strange choice of breakfast options? Where she's drinking red wine with her cereal? Well, I brought up the brand of wine, now let's take a look at the milk. It's clover. A seven-leaf clover is considered lucky. Holy moly! A seven-leaf clover! 
The movie ends as it began, but if we compare the shots from the beginning of the movie to the end, we can see how things have changed. How a quiet little neighborhood was overtaken by a media circus, and how Nick, who once daydreamed about cracking his wife's skull open, now flinches at the simple action of her turning her head. Click the playlist on the left to see my entire collection of Things You Missed episodes on David Fincher movies, and let me know in the comments if there are any directors or franchises you'd like to see me cover next. Until then, if you love horror, remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we stay inside.